Daria, I want to start with you, if that's okay, just for sequential order, if nothing else. One of, one of the things that I, th I thought was really interesting about the, you, you, you started with the projects that you were working with and then the, the, so the protocols or the standards or the different committees and so on. And I'm curious to know from your perspective, how often does technology or digital transformation, blockchain or not, come up in the in the forums and the conversations that you that you are part of or that you're chairing? Obviously, there's a traditional way to solve things with um, reviews, with documentation, with policy, with procedure, with protocol. But how often do you hear people step back and say, "Couldn't this be digitized? Couldn't this be automated? Is there a role for blockchain?" How, how often does that play out? And and who do you think are the main agitators of the people you work with and apologies to, to quote 2020 you're on mute daria oh i'm glad okay thank you that was kind of a really interesting question it's it's true i mean um we had the government mandate kind of uh basing the weight behind us kind of the adopting BIM 2016, okay? And we've previous sessions kind of, you know, questions and answers did say that that's actually a very important thing. It's an electronic data. You need that to be able to basically, you know, utilize some of the other technologies that require that data. I'm afraid I have to say that um, its adoption hasn't been so widespread. So starting with just purely BIM, which is kind of our kind of entry level in, so to speak, if you want to call it that. Um, I found a lot of organizations, I mean, we're, we're actually working with um, or looking into sort of high performing clients and teams and how they work and how collaboratively they work. It's interesting that some do acknowledge the use of that, the technology, but really I'm talking about, I mean, at basic level as in really still in terms of adoption of a BIM and understanding really what that, I mean, everyone talks about BIM level two, sometimes now we've moved away from the center of um, digital build grid, away from the level two category as such. But all of that is still, is we're still at the stage where we need to kind of get a confidence to adopt it. I mean, I, I the research I talked about from four years ago where, I talked with, um, well, I went and interviewed a lot of early adopters of BIM right at the outset. It was, and, and it was interesting because some were actually running it in parallel to their normal standard way of working to see how that works. And some were treating it as something that it's kind of a, you could bolt on to what you do. Whereas it's what David, you know, so Richard Saxon said, it's, it's, it's a sort of change in mindset and you need to do that. So I suppose the long and short story is that it's important. It's becoming more acknowledged through the golden thread of information of, um, you know, so basically that um, the Hackett uh, uh, report and working at the moment with basically the um, various advisory groups of the Ministry of Housing um, that we're looking at golden thread. We're looking at the various stages of approval to before uh, a, a kind of a build asset is actually occupied. And it's becoming, you know, it's, it, and, it, and the whole thing is acknowledging that we do need that process. We do need to have that digital technology. And so I think what the long and the short of that um, answer and it needs to be short is that initially from 2016 onwards, we still struggle with that, but a lot's gone on and, 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 and more acknowledgement about what he can do. And now it has center attention with the, the work that we're doing with the government, as I said, in particular with the golden thread of information that's required to track what's going on across the process. I think you've framed that really nicely, Daria. And I think the, the important observation there is it's not saying, you know, we need a blockchain. Right. The industry needs blockchain. We must have blockchain. We must blockchainify everything we possibly can under the sun, because I think then you're, you're taking a solution or a technology led view in. What you're saying is the parameters or the characteristics of what good would look like is a single thread that is tamper proof, that is available for all, that is immutable, 
that is standardized and digitized and that can go kind of live on beyond the life of a program or a project management tool that, um, that, that gets stood up by a contractor and then stood down again when the job's done. When you start putting all of those things together, you start, start ticking a few boxes towards, well, there's a technology that, that can do a lot of those things without having to add too much complexity. And it probably is blockchain, but it doesn't have to be. Right? If you can solve it with a, an Excel spreadsheet and a credit card, by all means do so. Um, you know, just don't make it the UK's COVID test results. Gavin, I want to ask you a, a similar sort of question, um, but probably more from a legal profession side. There are, I, I, I've seen that there are different pools of areas of those interested in, in, in blockchain technology in and around the legal um, community. Some of those are you know, law firms who've come out with specifically with blockchain practices. Um, you know, our, our colleagues, Mitch Condorea were on earlier today and, and they've got, you know, a team of developers and lawyers and a bunch of other stuff going on, which is super exciting. And then you've got some of the more traditional uh, law firms of the Magic Circle who, uh, you know, are paying lip service or, or, or citing specific propositions in and around blockchain businesses or registering decentralized entities. Um, and then there's some who are just sort of doing the work but not saying any, anything at all um, because of that's their culture or they don't want to... Um, have a perception that they are too innovative or working with anything that's too risky. Where do you see the agitators in and around blockchain in the legal community? The agitators in the community, very few. There's a, there are smaller, smaller law firms tend to be quite, not traditional, that's not, that's not the right word. They're more agile, certainly more akin to how you might have a tech startup, but by and large, they do the work how they do the work. Larger law firms have capacity to play with play with things. Um, and I'm aware of, uh, let's say, various big four uh, law firms that are using not, not just blockchain, but certainly AI tools. And I use that very very generously, I'm not convinced it is AI. It certainly isn't AI in the truest sense of AI. Um, and there are, of those big four, a couple of them do have their own incubator accelerators as well, which is quite interesting. And I don't fully understand how they're interacting. That, that they may be just be providing a platform. Are they actually actively involved uh, in an advisory type work as well? Maybe, I'm not sure. Um, and so, but that said, there are a, a lot of large law firms um, away from the big four that have, you know, in, innovation functions that, that have a lot of people spending a lot of time thinking about new technology, new ways of working as well, um, trying to reinvent law. And I know of many, many attempts to change how lawyers work, few if if any, really, really have made any difference because how there's, there's something very, and it is very antiquated, antiquated um, how lawyers work. And I, I, I was speaking, if I can just digress very slightly, um, I was talking to a chap called uh, Vinay Gupta um, a couple of years ago. I know the gentleman you're speaking of. He's, yeah, um, Materium, Materium, yeah. one of the fans of Materium. And, um, he, he's not a lawyer himself, but he, he has quite quite good insight into, into lawyers. And, and he made the point that, well, you know, the, the, the function of an advocate broadly, which is what a, a lawyer, a solicitor or barrister is, has not changed since the dawn of time. And I know we, we make jokes about a certain other profession being the oldest profession, but really, probably law is, is, is older. You can imagine, you know, I... Okay, I don't want to get into um, any analogies, but, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, tens of thousands of years ago, let's just say before I, I say something, I, 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 before I misspeak, and there's a dispute breaks out between two people. Somebody would advocate a position. Somebody would say, well, we've agreed this before, we've done this before. That's precedent. And so that's broadly speaking that's what the law is it's it's what parties commonly agree to be the case between themselves and what has happened previously and that's not changed and that will never change else you wouldn't have law but can you support lawyers in doing that job better yes absolutely can you change how that job is done no because that's how it's done and it's the the only way it can be done you could have yes you could have ai 
uh, representatives, um, you know, for those parties, but then you've just got two AIs arguing because neither party will trust one AI to make a decision. And then you probably have a third AI to make a decision. So now you've got three AIs arguing over what a case is and what if they can't reach a decision. The, the beautiful thing about people is that we can cut through that. And there are judges that have taken very liberal routes through decision making um, to come to an answer because that's what we need. We need certainty to have an answer. We need to move on. So uh, it, it, it's difficult. I, there is a lot of opportunity there, but you, 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 you have to respect the profession. And, and, and certainly when, when I hear comments, you know, smart contracts for the death of lawyers, things like that, it, it's naive in the extreme because all that means is the, the workload of lawyers will increase because you don't really understand what a smart contract is and nobody does. And, and certainly the conversation earlier, um, I, I think highlighted the, the difficulties and, and May made this point, um, I think, the difficulties with what is a smart contract. We don't even know what a smart contract is. Well, how can you rely on one if we don't know what it is? Um, and I have my own views on that. It's, it's difficult. It's difficult. Law is, law is a difficult, law is a harsh mistress, as, uh, as I said in my, my presentation. And, you know, there's no easy way around that. But if it were easy, we'd already be doing it, of course. Indeed. I, um, <laughs> it's true. And, and I, I genuinely, every time I give a, the kind of the blockchain in for legal services or blockchain in the domain of law, the, the, the bad news is often that we're creating automation for the stuff that should go away. But the, the, the critical thing is that as we get work in more contentious domains, as we start transforming things that are more complex, we're not going to need less legal support. We're going to need more. The more we break things, the more we challenge the norm, the more we pr press on regulatory boundaries, the more likely we are to need legal support to get through that. Because like it or not, we have laws, regulators and established models that are going to be broken. And the first person you call is not a consultant. It's a lawyer. Um, you know, so so all those in the legal profession out there, please don't give up hope yet. I'm just I'm going to see if I can pick one of the comments from the, the chat here. Um, Sagar has been absolutely dominating the chat. I think he's got about 99% coverage. Um, so I'm just trying to see if I can uh, kind of pick one that works particularly. I, there's a couple of pointed here specifically, Daria. Daria, there's a clarification question here for you. The difference between computation construction law versus construction law. I think Could you double question. click on that one for us? <laughs> I think uh, that's a kind of a legal question. Probably actually Gavin is better suited to answer. I mean, I do have an, um, some area of expertise in that, but I'm not an, you know, an expert in the field. So if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of pass that question on to Gavin, actually. <laughs> it's okay, Gavin. The difference between computation construction law and construction law? Yes. I'm, 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 I'm not sure what you mean by, again, so the, the lawyer's defense. What do you mean by computation construction law? Um, <laughs> construction law is, is obviously just just the law. It is, it is what it is as it pertains to to the construction industry. Computation construction law. I, this could be a new area of law. This this could be very exciting. We could create it right here in this um, in this forum. Um, I, th I think I, what I would say what I would say is that and, and there's been a lot of chat about smart contracts in the previous session and so on. Broadly speaking, the law around contracts would apply to any analysis of a smart contract. And if that's what you're going to do, then the law as it applies now would be used to interpret uh, or would be interpreted in the context of whatever it is you're, 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 you're arguing about. And I think, uh, broadly speaking, well, I, uh, I know I've said it, but I'll say it again, smart contracts are neither smart nor contracts. Um, and it's, it's a complete misnomer and, and we don't really know what they are. They are an implementation of a contract, but they are not the contract so i at this point i would say i would have a hazard caution and say don't don't think that what you're writing mr coder mr developer is a contract it's it's not it's the implementation of such at best but that doesn't mean that liability won't attach to you if you get it wrong so be careful I hope that answers thank you that. Well, I mean, the beautiful thing is, is the comment section might lag. So, you know, you, you can't be wrong right now. You might be wrong later, but you can't be wrong right now. Um, maybe maybe I'll ask, ask, I'll ask a punt to both Daria and Gavin, sort of forward looking view. Um, obviously, we've talked about a bunch of different, you've, obviously you've seen speakers as well before this, talk about a bunch of different domains, whether it's BIM, whether it's project management, whether it's safety, um, whether it's permissioning um, or, or project commissioning. There's a whole bunch of places where 
um, we, we can see the benefit or the opportunity to transform the construction sector. And yet, it still, and yet it still hasn't come about, or yet there, there are still barriers, or, or we, we haven't got to the place where we think we've got 10 great examples of having already happened, you know, and, and so it becomes state of the art or standard. Dari, I'll start with you. What, what is the area of construction that you think is likely to transform first? Question one. And question two is the area that you would like to tra see transformed the most? I think. I think for both those, and I think I will can actually, you know, sort of confirm that because I've been hammering it and, and talking about it time, time again. It's the uh, payment mechanisms and, and the, the payments in the industry and look at Corellium. I mean, look at the fact that we work on the low margins, um, the fact that we've, you know, sort of look towards kind of procurement models that kind of are led by price and not value. All of those things, are, you know. So basically, it, it, and and also, you know, sort of basically, as I said, that sort of tracking system of kind of you know money coming in, when is it coming in, and when the poor subcontractor and supplier will get paid. So for me, the, the passion is if I sort of have a way of coming along and working alongside you, Ashley Anthony, and and trying to sort this out will definitely be to sort out, and we've got the tools now, we've got blockchain, we've got sort of smart legal or intelligent contract that we might be able to use. With all of those, I really like to see us really tackling the, the biggest problem we have in the industry, and that's you know, sorting out payment mechanisms. Very good, thank you, Daria, great answer as always. Um, <laughs> Gavin, AKA, AKA Harvey of the Built Environment, your your prediction for the most likely area of transformation and the one that you would like to see most most transformed? Oh, my goodness me. Uh, that's not an open question at, at all, is it? <laughs> <clears throat> I, well, I, what would I, 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 in this in this circumstance, I, I wonder what would make my life easier? <laughs> I, I, I do think an assistant um, uh, a smart legal assistant would be very useful. There's a lot of mundane tasks, and, and we, we've touched on them uh, in, our, in our session as well as earlier, that lawyers have to do administration of law that is, is not lawyering. It, it takes time away from lawyers uh, to think about the law, to think about their client's case, to, to work out what is the best strategy, what is the best... What is the best way to tackle a problem? What is the best solution? And and, and I had it as well as a, as a certainly as a senior lawyer um, in practice that I would spend day after day after day project managing a situation. Now, I'm a lawyer. I'm not a project manager. I, okay, I'm capable of doing it, of course, but it's not what I want to be doing. So certainly tools that can alleviate that, and that, certainly a smart legal assistant is, is quite a clever idea. I think in that you know legal assistant, please just go and do. This. go and find this point of law, go and, go and file this document wherever it needs to be filed. I've prepared it, but you go and do it. Um, you know, send this communication to a client, do this, do that. And I think that that is certainly an area for, uh, of untapped potential, but it requires a lot of, that's quite, quite a um, uh, later generational solution. You know, that what, what we have now, generation one is, can we just digitize what we do? Pen and paper, can we digitize it in some way? Next is... I don't know, big data, story narrative, thematic, semantic analysis. After that, it's, okay, now here's your, you know, semi-AI intelligence uh, system that can help you. So, I don't know, that's pretty open. I, I don't know if that answers the question, but it's um, certainly what the Harvey of the built environment was. <laughs> it's going on my business card. It is, it is. Anthony there we go. said so. Yeah. I, I will happily call it. You can have one of that in quotations underneath your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> Direct quote. <laughs> Direct quote. I'll take it. I'll take it. You can have it. Um, I guess we've got just a couple of minutes left, and then we'll let guys go for for a coffee because obviously it's late and um, we've been talking for a long time. Um, some guidance. Obviously, you've both spent a little bit of time working in and around technology and the topic of blockchain. Um, what is for aspiring lawyers or for those in the legal profession who are still trying to get into this space? What is the one piece of learning or reference or or observation or insight that you've gleaned over the past few months that you wish everybody else knew or that you wish you'd, you'd known months ahead of the time that you actually learned it. 
Dari, I'll come to you first again, if that's okay. What's the what what's what's the thing that you wish you knew earlier, or that you wish everybody else knew about uh, legal technology, blockchain, or, or anything else? Um, what would I know in the day? Um, I think um, that's an interesting one. I mean, I've I've kind of listed out all the ones that are actually trickling through um, the um, sort of um, the industry, and um, as part of. It was interesting as part of um, the um, report um, that I thought with Professor David Mosey for Future Cities Categories, I kind of predicted that we could actually um, use basically, you know, sort of basic sort of cameras and top of hard hats and, and go on site and check, which is exactly what actually Richard Saxon um, had talked about. Um, I actually predicted that that was. That would have been a really good chat. Actually, very simple. Have the camera on top. Yeah, yeah. So you're a hide hat. Have a look, go, go and have a look around, see what's been done, see how it's done against uh, kind of a basically a um, BIM model that's been created and see if there are any discrepancies. And you can also see my prediction was that it would be a good idea to have it for even checking quality of workmanship which came back to that response to the all-party parliamentary um, group's uh, publication. So I think uh, uh, it would have been really... And then, of course, we've got... I, the other day, I actually saw a company who's just set up exactly that, and that was quite exciting. So this is something I kind of predicted about, uh, kind of about four years, three, four years ago, and that's come through. So it would have been, you know, it would have been quite nice to actually sort of uh, uh, have that uh, basically... Uh, sort of in, implemented more widely and is coming through anyway. So that was kind of what excited me actually to see that company that was set up recently and is actually working with a number of contractors purely on that basis, working to check quality of workmanship and working to see what is being done because some of the issues we have on site is what's been specified and what's actually been installed and not mm. one of the same. We've seen that. Have got. So that was kind of that was kind of exciting that I saw. Um, you know, uh, that it really kind of excited me. I thought, well, actually, you know, someone's actually somehow less, you know, read the report, but then it couldn't have because we did an NDA and we went and um, it's probably locked in some vault and kind of really not used or seen, and, and we're not supposed to talk about it. But it was exciting that somebody must have heard and and, and this has actually happened. <laughs> Very good. The, the pace of change is rapid in the sector. Only only three to four years for it to come through. But that's amazing. Uh, yeah, it was. It was very exciting. There we go. Thank you very much, Derek. Gavin, same question to yourself. Oh. Tomorrow's lottery numbers. Does that count? Does that, well, that would have been nice to know. About. If, if you already knew those and you wished you knew them and you wished to know them three months ago, I suppose it wouldn't have put you in any different of a position. But you know, the thing the thing that you think everybody should know about technology or legal tech or blockchain that that most people either take for granted or or just haven't got to the realization. It's a very fluid space, and you have to be prepared to put in the effort, uh, reading, understanding commentary uh, again we've had uh, I, I go back to the smart contracts that we've been discussing today if lawyers can't agree what a smart contract is then you know you're in trouble those people who should know what a contract is can't agree then that's a big problem um so understanding certainly understanding um we are making time to 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 read into technology as it arises it's hard of course there's, there's so much rapid change day to day um, in technology and, and staying on top of, of new startups and, and, and so on is virtually impossible. Um, and, and it's nearly my full-time job. So I, it, I would say, yeah, be prepared to put in the effort when it comes to trying to understand these things and read broadly. Uh, it's, the only, it's the only way. Be aware, ask questions, get involved with the CVC. I mean, come and ask us questions. And, you know, if we don't know the answer, we'll certainly endeavor to find them out and, and let you know, because it's, if the answer isn't, isn't necessarily obvious or readily found, then it's, then it's a point that, you know, needs to be considered and, and thought about in more detail. So, um, yeah, I mean, be part, become part of the conversation um, uh, and get, in, get involved. I'll, I'll summary that is if you if you if you're not sure if you don't know come ask an expert and if you can't find one of those there's plenty of other people who'll give you an opinion also. 
Mostly even lawyers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Plenty of opinions from lawyers. <laughs> All right, thank you everybody for the chat. Thank you everybody for the comments. Daria, thank you very much for your presentation. Gavin also, thank you everybody who listens to my analogies on Harvey Balls and uh, how to represent data through pictures of, of, of fiction, fictional lawyers. Hopefully you guys learned something. Hope you guys had a bit of fun. It was a slightly different uh, jaw through a, 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 blockchain, a blockchain story and update on construction. So thank you everyone for listening. Thank you for taking the time. And uh, obviously feel free to reach out to, to any of this group on, on LinkedIn or social, anywhere you can find us uh, if you want to continue the conversation. Uh, and Leo, thanks very much again for inviting us. Thank you very much for that, Anthony. That was brilliant. Uh, a very good discussion. Um, yeah, absolutely. And it just made me think, actually, your, your question about, you know, what you wish people had known or, or know now. Um, I was just reading uh, for the white paper uh, that we mentioned earlier, uh, Deloitte uh, 2020 blockchain survey. And it was commenting how uh, they did the survey of, I think, about 1,400 um, people globally. Uh, and it was saying that um, well, 80% of those people said that they were confident about the regulatory uh, requirements around uh, new technologies. And it was making the comment that actually this might be um, quite complacent. I think people might be overconfident about how um, it's going to fit in with the requirements. Um, so that was quite interesting. And uh, obviously, now is a uh, the time to plug our white paper because Gavin has gone into an excellent level of depth into trying to figure out what this might be. So, uh, so it's all in your inboxes, everyone, if you, <laughs> if you want to have a read. Awesome, so, um, awesome. yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go check it out. White, white paper in your inboxes, token, token launch coming soon, airdrop, not, you know, not, not too long after that. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Yes. Okay, we'll uh, so we'll break now for fifteen minutes, and then we'll uh, resume at uh, four forty-five UK time for the Peshaku uh, sessions. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you. Thank Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.